All right, welcome back. So the title of this mini lecture is Reconstruction Part 2. We're going to pick up where we left off from uh, the first Reconstruction mini lecture, and we're going to talk about five things that you need to know when it comes to understanding or learning more about Reconstruction from about 1868 until its conclusion. Uh, again, there's a lot more to it than just five things, but the goal of this is just to, to give you a quick overview of a few things to keep in mind when you go to do more reading about the topic of Reconstruction. All right, first off, occupation. All right, so once the Civil War came to an end in early 1865, generally from 1865 until about 1877, the presence of United States soldiers uh, was something that was a part of everyday life across the American South, across the former Confederacy. Now, the presence of these soldiers was there to accomplish a couple of things, uh, obviously to enforce U.S. law, uh, obviously to protect uh, African Americans and their families, right? They have a number of different things that they're supposed to be doing. Uh, their presence was universally reviled by white Southerners. Uh, you know, some of this has to do with the fact that some of these soldiers are in fact African Americans themselves. Uh, so there's a real sense of loathing there. Uh, and a real reflection that they, they felt that they were living under a sort of occupied territory, this kind of thing, real defeatist uh, sort of element there. So occupation, this is one thing to uh, to be aware of. Second, uh, black codes, black codes. So uh, during the antebellum period in the slave south, there were what were referred to as slave codes. And these generally were state and local laws and uh, codes that structured in terms of what you know, an owner of a, an enslaved person, what they could do to them, what they couldn't do to them, what rights they had, what rights they didn't have, right, this kind of thing. Uh, these were what kind of structured or, you know, sort of um, defined aspects of the institution of slavery. After the Civil War is over, slave codes will be changed into what are called black codes. Uh, and what you end up seeing is a similar effort on the part of white Southerners creating their new state governments and local governments, uh, further wishing to institutionalize white supremacy in the post-war world, uh, supporting these codes. So they're very similar to slave codes. Uh, they just you know, change the names, basically. Uh, now, the black code system itself is important for a number of reasons, not only, of course, the uh, cultural effect this will have on the daily life effect this will have on African Americans, but this, of course, becomes part of that institutionalized system of Jim Crow uh, segregation. All right, third, uh, sharecropper, all right, sharecropper. So the economy of the American South is transformed after the Civil War. It is economically distressed and depressed for decades. They don't return to their pre-war economic levels until the 19-teens. Uh, you do see, of course, some plantation owners hold on to their plantations and enrich themselves, but the manner in which they do that, of course, is through different kinds of economic planning and operations uh, different from what they would have had before the war. So the concept of a sharecropper basically is an individual rents land, okay, they rent land from a planter, right, from a farm owner or a plantation owner, uh, and in exchange uh, for working that land, uh, you have to pay uh, the owner, uh, basically, you know, sort of come harvest time, right? So uh, you would take out a loan in which to be able to do this, with the understanding being that you would be able to pay back this individual uh, based on what you would earn when you could eventually sell your crop at market. Now, the possibilities for fairness in the marketplace theoretically they would exist. But of course, in reality, many of the individuals who are sharecropping here are, you know, there are certainly impoverished whites who are doing this, but recently freed, uh, you know, African American men uh, and their families are going to be taking out a lot of these sharecropping uh, loans and these these things. And of course, the, the price of the cotton market, right, is going to continue to go down uh, in the 1870s. And so as a result, you really, it's a cyclical poverty, right, that's going to last through into the 20th century. Uh, four, uh, the election of 1876. So the typical date that we usually say that Reconstruction came to an end formally was 1877, and that is based on 
uh, the election of 1876 when Rutherford B. Hayes is elected to become the president of the United States. Uh, there's a backroom deal as a part of this, and Hayes agrees to pull federal troops out of the American South. Uh, and so by 1877, there's no real protection for African Americans across the South. Uh, and, uh, you know, Reconstruction comes to an end, and African Americans are disenfranchised, and it's a very terrible thing. Uh, okay, number five. Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. So this was a Supreme Court case, 1896, and this is the Supreme Court case that really kind of puts a cap on what uh, the Jim Crow uh, sort of institution had been working for, uh, this idea of legitimizing white supremacy and racial segregation, uh, and they do so, of course, uh, with this U.S. Supreme Court case. So it is Plessy versus Ferguson, where separate but equal uh, comes in that you can segregate individuals on the basis of race, so long as the facilities are equal. Of course, that's ignored. The other thing to note with Plessy versus Ferguson is that it's not singularly just in the American South. Remember, the Jim Crow system, all this process, it is most on display in the American South, but it's nationwide. Uh, it's, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court determines the constitutionality of law all over the country, meaning uh, segregation occurred nationwide. Okay? Thank you.